from the management team we have with us today, Global CEO Jay Shroff, but he's down with a bad throat, so I would apologize on his behalf that he won't be able to present today. We do have our group CFO, Rajendra Darak, President and COO, Mike Frank, Global CFO, Anand Vora, and Chief Supply Chain Officer, Raj Tiwari. We are also joined by the head of our India business, Mr. Ashish Dobul. We will start with an overview from uh, uh, and a financial update from uh, uh, Mike and uh, Anand, and followed by the Q&A. With that, let me now hand it over to Mike. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Radhika, and hello, everyone. It's been a fast and exciting first six months for me at UPL. Best of all has been working with our amazing team around the globe as we hope helping farmers become more successful with a commitment to reimagining sustainability in everything that we do. We continue to operate a highly volatile and uncertain world, and we take pride in the agility of our team, strong customer relationships, unique backward integration, and our supply chain resilience to address these challenges head on. Our strong results in the first quarter demonstrate this competitive advantage. I would like to also highlight two important achievements for the last quarter. First, we're excited about our recently announced collaboration with Bungie for the creation of Grigio in Brazil, which is subject to antitrust approvals. This innovative company will increase productivity, profitability, and sustainability for farmers in five states of the north and northeast region of Brazil. Secondly, after extensive trials, we have also launched the first flupyramin-based insecticide in India to protect rice fields by controlling brown plant hopper and yellow stem borer on rice, making it an important milestone uh, with our collaboration with Mitsui Chemical Subsidiary, MMAG. So now turning to our performance highlights, in Q1, we have experienced strong growth across the Americas. In particular, the favorable market conditions and strong commodity prices allowed us to improve close margins in Brazil, and we have grown uh, both volume and price in the U.S. market. Multiple challenges have been faced in Europe, including unfavorable weather conditions, the impact of product bans, and the war in Ukraine, and overall, the devaluation of the country. In spite of that, we continue to see strong growth in our business in Europe. In India, the application timing was impacted by delayed... Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like Mr. Frank's line is disconnected. We request you to please hold the line while we reconnect him back. Please do not disconnect. Gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We have the line from Mr. Mike Frank connected. Over to you, sir. Yes, thank you. Sorry that I got disconnected. As I was saying, we continue to operate in a highly volatile and uncertain world, and we take pride in the agility of our team, our strong customer relationships, unique backward integration, and our supply chain resilience to address these challenges head on. Our strong results in the first quarter demonstrate this competitive advantage. I would like to highlight two important achievements for the last quarter. First, we're excited about the recently announced collaboration with Bungie for the creation of Origio in Brazil, which is still subject to antitrust approvals. This innovative company will increase productivity, profitability, and sustainability for farmers in five states of the north and northeastern regions of Brazil. Secondly, after extensive trials, we have also launched the first flupyramin-based insecticide in India to protect rice fields by controlling brown plant hopper and yellow stem borer on rice, making it an important milestone in our collaboration with Mitsui Chemical Subsidiary, MMAG. So now turning to our 
performance highlights, in Q1, we have experienced strong growth across the Americas. In particular, the favorable market conditions and strong commodity prices allowed us to improve gross margins in Brazil, and we grew both volume and price in the U.S. market. Multiple challenges have faced uh, our team in Europe, including unfavorable weather conditions, the impact of product bans, and, of course, the war in Ukraine, as well as the overall devaluation of the currency. Despite all those challenges, we did see strong growth in our European business. In India, the application timing was impacted by delayed plantings. So moving to the financial results, our revenue as well as our EBITDA for the quarter have both grown by 27% versus Q1 of our last fiscal year. The growth in revenue was led by significantly improved price realizations, coupled with a healthy volume increase, despite the multiple challenges. Our contribution margin stood at around 44%, enabled by 18% price realizations, offsetting the inflationary input and freight costs. Our EBITDA margins lowered slightly as a result of increasing our investments in SG&A. The key driver for this SG&A increase was related to employee costs, which were around an increase of 214 crores. We intentionally increased our headcount versus last year in the areas of R&D, our NPP biosolutions business, and in our Southeast Asia business, where we're transitioning that business to a B2C model. Let us now talk about the performance of our regions in the quarter. In Latin America, we achieved a strong 38% growth, led by our herbicide portfolio and through improved pricing. The growth was mostly led by Brazil, driven by a robust demand for post-emergent herbicides and strong price realization. Argentina and Andean countries also contributed to overall growth of the region, mostly driven by herbicides. As another highlight in Latin America, our NPP biosolutions business achieved a strong double-digit growth in Mexico and the Andean countries. In North America, revenue grew by 47% in this quarter due to higher volumes as well as improved price realization. Our performance was supported by high commodity prices with strong growth in both U.S. and Canada. Despite challenges, which included the drought in Western U.S., where we have a strong NPP biosolutions business, this did impact that part of our business in Q1 in that specialty crop market. The pre-emergent herbicides have led the growth in the region through a mix of volume and price. We also successfully launched our new three-way herbicide in soybeans, Preview. I visited with our U.S. field technical team last week, and the field results are looking fantastic. We expect Preview to really start ramping up in the next crop season. In Europe, we grew by a robust 13%. This strong performance has been achieved through increased volume growth and higher price realization. Among major countries, growth in France was led by NPP Biosolutions. Central Europe grew through a mix of volume increase as well as price. The European business achieved this growth despite multiple challenges that I mentioned earlier, including the devaluation of the euro by around 6% against the INR versus last year. In India, we achieved a moderate growth of 8%, much impacted by the delayed planting of key crops. Regarding crop protection, our NPP Biosolutions portfolio delivered strong growth. In addition, we're pleased that our procurement based sales have started in the last quarter. Among other businesses, Advanta's growth has been led by by corn-related sales. Due to the recent start of the monsoon season, we are now seeing significant product applications in the field, which will set up for a strong Q2. The rest of the world delivered a 31% growth in revenues driven by significant increases in volumes and supported by improved price. Significant growth in Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand were led by insecticides and fungicides despite the supply constraints. This increased TXL acquisition in Indonesia. 
Strong growth was also achieved in Western and Central Africa, largely driven by our insecticide. Sales in China were negatively impacted by unfavorable weather that affected key crops and by channel stocks, while Japan was impacted due to the devaluation of the Japanese yen. During our Capital Markets Day presentation in May, we emphasized the importance of our Advanta business. For this reason, we would like to share the financial details of Advanta for the last quarter. Advanta had a strong performance with revenue growth of 28% led by field corn in India, canola in Australia, and field corn and fresh corn in Thailand. We also saw a margin improvement of 60 basis points driven by improved pricing and product mix and an overall EBITDA increase of 27%, impacted by higher investments in SG&A to pursue our B2C strategy. As part of our reimagining sustainability efforts, in the last quarter, we hosted the second Open Ag Symposium in partnership with the University of Oxford and the Oxford India Centre for Sustainable Development and discussed the role of global agriculture on the path to net zero. Also, we have launched our first ever Africa Sustainability Report, showcasing UPL's commitment to farmers and food systems across the content, continent. Before I hand over to Anand, our global CFO, I would like to highlight that we are poised to deliver strong growth for the year. Considering this positive outlook, we are revising our FY23 guidance to 50%, 15% growth for revenue and 15 to 18% growth for EBITDA. Our strong Q1 performance, anticipated robust demand for our portfolio of solutions for the balance of the year, and an expectation of contribution margin expansion support the revised guidance. We will also be very diligent with SG&A as we are experiencing inflation across our various SG&A components. Lastly, and very importantly, we are also laser focused on the working capital management and delivering a strong net cash flow for the year. While Anand will get into the details on working capital and net debt, I would like to emphasize here that we remain committed to deliver 80 days of working capital by the end of the year. Finally, I would like to congratulate and thank our team for their resilience, dedication, and unified focus in delivering such strong performance in this quarter, despite challenges on several fronts. I will now turn it over to Anand to take a deeper dive into the financial performance. Thank you, Mike. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today. I'll begin by discussing the key financial highlights for the first quarter and then take you through the detailed financials. At the outset, I'm delighted to share that we have delivered a solid all-round operational performance during the first quarter, marked by robust growth in both revenue and profitability. Delivering such a solid performance against the backdrop of challenging macro environment and significant input cost pressures vindicates the robustness of our business model, and more important, our team's ability to adjust and deliver superior performance in a dynamic environment. Talking specifically about our quarter year-on-year -year performance on the key financial metrics in Q1, we ended the first quarter with revenues of over 10,800 crores, reporting a robust growth of 27% of which 6% came from volume growth, 18% from price increase, and 3 due to favorable exchange impact. Almost all major regions delivered double-digit growth, and as Mike alluded to earlier, we are confident of a strong performance in Q2, including India, which had seen muted growth in Q1 due to the delayed monsoon. Contribution margins were higher by 7 basis points, on the back of improved margins in our herbicide portfolio and improved margins in our Latin American market. SG&A expenses rose by 29% as the company invested in building teams and capabilities to grow its differentiated and sustainable portfolio, 
strengthen distribution capability and normalization of overheads post covid however it's heartening to see that we are still able to keep our ebitda margins intact and deliver a strong ebitda growth of 26% strong contribution and ebitda growth led to 29% growth in net profit after taxes minority interest and exceptional cost on the finance cost and other income let me share with you certain details as you would have seen the first, the finance cost in q1 are lower by 88 crores this reduction is largely on account of gains on hedges taken against advance orders overall interest cost has for the quarter gone up to 478 crores on the back of increase in the libor rates and the base rate in most of the country as regards other income for the quarter we had an expense of 124 crores versus 41 crores in the same quarter of last year this again was largely on account of mark to market on receivables and payables across various geographies therefore net exchange gain year on year for the quarter has been 183 crores tax for the quarter was 59 crores and we expect to end the year as per the guidance of 12 to 15% of expected tax rate that's the etr previous year same quarter due to losses in brazil in q1 on account of foreign exchange impact and recognition of certain deferred tax asset in our swiss subsidiary we had a next net tax credit of 152 crores for the minority interest rate rose significantly due to the superior performance of our global business despite the increase in tax and minority interest we reported a net profit growth of 29% uh, to 877 crores while the earning per share grew by 33% to INR rupees 10.76 The first quarter also witnessed an increase of rupees 5,608 crores in net working capital on a sequential basis, primarily on account of four major factors. We saw a robust growth in sales of 27%. There has been a conscious reduction in factoring quantum by almost 3,000 crores in Q1 FY23, as compared to 619 crores in Q1 FY22. to optimize this was done largely to optimize the interest cost in certain geographies which saw a disproportionate spike in factoring premium as a result of this receivables and net working capital was higher by 28 days inventory is higher by 10 days due to built up in inventory on account of strong demand and uncertainties around around the supply chain however notwithstanding the reduced factoring and the fx forex action impact of 588 crores the increase in net networking capital would have been lower at 1931 crores vis-a-vis the 5600 600 crores reflecting actually a reduction of 11 days year on year the net debt at the end of first quarter stood at 7574 crores as compared to march 2022 levels of 26480 crores primarily due to significant increase in working capital as highlighted earlier however adjusting for the reduced factoring that's of 3000 odd crores the fx impact and the implied increase in net debt as a sequential basis would have been lower by INR 3392 crores vis-a-vis the uh, vis-a-vis the 7574 crores accordingly the implied net debt would have been around 22300 crores as of june as compared to 26480 crores as is reported going forward we expect the working capital days to be in line with our guidance of 80 days by the end of the year this would lead to a significant release of working capital in second half of fy23 enabling us to manage our net debt position effectively by the end of the year 
Further, as Mike and Jay, as Mike highlighted, we have revised both revenue and EBITDA growth range uh, range guidance for FY23 upwards by 300 basis point and 500 basis point respective, respectively, considering the improved performance. On this optimistic note, I would request I would hand over back to the operator, and we can start the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who has a question may enter star and one. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Our first question is from the line of Prashant Piani from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so what would be the mandate of our JV with Bungie and uh, why to form a new JV after Bungie's investment in Sinacro? Yeah, hello Prashant. I'll, uh, I'll take that question. So yeah, this is the, uh, the second uh, venture that we have uh, entered with Bungie. Uh, we see them as a very good partner for our business in Brazil. They have an extensive uh, soybean trading business, as you as you likely know, and, and they're they're very strong, uh, particularly uh, in the country of Brazil. The the opportunity we have with Origio is in the five states where that business is focused. Largely, those are are large growers that are not uh, served by extensive retailers in that region, and so. There's not, an, uh, there's not a significant overlap between our Sinagro business and the geography where the original business uh, is being focused. And so this is an opportunity for us to take an entire portfolio to these large growers um, and, and work, with, work with them in a way that not only brings them solutions, uh, focus, focusing on sustainability and yield, but also a complete package including uh, the the uh, buying of their grain on the back end, which helps from a risk management standpoint. So it's a very unique model, um, and we're very excited about this opportunity to really um, grow our business in that region of Brazil uh, where we don't have a significant presence today. Sure. Uh, so secondly, uh, while Europe is going through a very unfortunate gas crisis, but uh, Business-wise, it would be beneficial for ACM players or it may be a loss of business uh, due to lower agriculture activity? Yeah, so Prashant, the agricultural activity continues across Europe. I mean, obviously, there's been an impact uh, with the conflict in Ukraine, uh, as well as, you know, hot, dry conditions across much of Europe over the past month, uh, especially. Uh, that being said, you know, we're, we're, we continue to see uh, opportunities for our portfolio in Europe. Um, our NPP business is exceptionally strong in Europe, and so we've seen good growth of that business in several countries. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the gas situation, I would say, is not impacting agriculture and not impacting the, uh, you know, what farmers are doing in the field. And therefore, our business continues to evolve, and, and we're, we're having a, you know good momentum there. So, would we have uh, any nutrient-based product uh, to uh, which can be placed against fertilizers? Uh, because fertilizers have been quite expensive now, so it may be an opportunity for those nutrient-based uh, products to be sold. Yes, absolutely, and it's a very exciting part of our. NPP portfolio where we have microbials and, and other uh, nutritional products which really help uh, growers, um, you know, create stronger roots and ultimately manage uh, some of their increasing costs that they're seeing with fertilizer. Maybe I'll, I'll ask Ashish to provide uh, some, some color to the situation. We have a very strong portfolio in India and we've expanded it recently. And so, Ashish, maybe you can highlight some of the opportunities and products that we're selling in, in India and how they're helping farmers with uh, managing their overall fertilizer costs. 
Sure. So I think for these uh, scarcity is a big, big problem in India, and I think we are very, very well equipped for it. Right? We have perhaps the biggest uh, NPT or the biofuel portfolio in India, starting so right from the time when soil is prepared. Uh, we have products, you know, we have mycorrhiza based product, which actually helps to pick up the fertilizers from soil. And we all know that, you know, uh, fertilizers are lying here in soil, and, and, and a lot of the, uh, the elements are, are immobile. I mean, these products help them to uh, pick the extra fertilizers or the extra uh, macro and micro elements from the soil. We have uh, products like, uh, you know, phosphates, uh, phosphate solubilizing bacteria. You know, which can actually uh, move the phosphorus, uh, which is already there in the soil. Then we have products, you know, these days, uh, you know, fertilizer case is one thing, but we also have a huge challenge on the kind of heat that we are seeing in India. Again, we are very, very well placed with that, and where we have uh, certain stress, uh, you know, uh, abiotic stress products, uh, which are very, very uh, established products. So I think we, have, we have the full range uh, of which can help to counter this entire thing on the uh, on the on the fertilizer shortage. We also have, you know, in addition to this, we also have uh, liquid fertilizers, which are, uh, you know, uh, having macro and uh, micronutrient mix, which also uh, has been very very good in India. Um, sure. uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. We will take a next question from the line of Giri Shashipalya for Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Thanks for the, the opportunity. Uh, is it possible to guide a range on interest costs? Because uh, we are saying that uh, 80 days is a networking capital at the end of the day, year. Obviously, your expectation on interest costs would have increased uh, given what is happening. So if you can guide on that range. Secondly, uh, what is the net debt reduction guidance? And does it include it? Does it include the share buyback, or is it excluding the share buyback uh, amount that you've already spent in Q1? Yeah, thanks, Girish. Uh, this is Anand here. Uh, on the interest costs, uh, you're you're right. You know, I mean, there is a spike because of the base increase in uh, LIBOR or so forth. As these days, that's been the benchmark, and we are seeing corresponding increase in most countries. And we we expect uh, at least uh, the Interest uh, cost level, I'm not talking the finance cost, the interest cost are anywhere in the range of around 300 million uh, uh, would be the uh, overall uh, cost of uh, borrowings, you know, for the financial year, full financial year. So that's that's on the interest cost. And uh, uh, on the net debt uh, guidance, uh, you know, we, we, we have told at the beginning we are looking at 400. Uh, I think, as uh, Mike also alluded, we are committed to uh, rein in the working capital, and we are we are at least at this stage we we are maintaining what it is. But we will keep you updated as we move forward of quarter on quarter. All efforts are being made to see wherever uh, possible to reduce the working capital and see how we can reduce the net debt. So, is this number gross of the share buyback or net of the share buyback? The 400 million. It's gross of the share buy. Okay. And uh, if you can guide on the CAPEX, because your run rate on growth is uh, as surprise on the upside, is there any upward guidance to that? And I also see in your exceptional items, uh, insurance claim worth close to 600 odd crores or higher. So if you can provide any color on when this money would be received? No, so as far as the capex, we are not changing the guidance. Either we are retaining our guidance, or what we had said at the beginning of the year, around 300, 325 million dollars. And as far as the insurance claim in the exceptional, we are, you know, we as we are, you know, these are large amounts. The insurance care companies are taking a bit of a time, but we, we are confident of getting these claims uh, either this quarter or definitely by next quarter. So that's that's the uh, plan as of now. Uh, that's Thank what we hear from the insurance company. Yeah. Sure. I'll get back in queue. Thank you. Thanks, Girish, for joining us. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Abhiram Ayer from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, I had similar questions sort of mirroring on the net debt reduction. Uh, now, uh, obviously, we're targeting 400 million net debt reduction uh, over the year. And it's gone in the opposite direction because of lower factor in receivables. 
So is it fair to say that towards the end of the years, uh, the reduction might potentially come from the reversal of the slower receivables or or um, will, would this come through a different avenue in terms of paying down the debt from our cash flows? No, I think uh, for this quarter, at least we did the assessment, uh, you know, and we kept the <clears throat> we chose to do the borrowings, the normal borrowings, rather than do the factoring. Now we'll assess the situation. So, but you know, typically, as you know, every uh, at least beginning for Q1, Q2, and Q3, the the working capital keeps going up, uh, and then in Q4 we have the drop in working capital as we see the collections coming through from Latin America as well as uh, from the European and U.S. markets. So that, that's the trajectory. If you look at the last five years, you will see that working capital going up quarter on quarter, and then it drops in Q4. Uh, as far as factoring is concerned, we, we would like to maintain at the same levels because what we are seeing is increasingly as far as the rating agencies are concerned, they don't uh, give us the benefit of factoring, although almost, uh, not almost, not a single dollar of factoring is with recourse. All our factoring is without recourse. So clearly, and also as far as delinquency is concerned in terms of our receivables, it's a very low ratio. We also take credit insurance. So we will now, see as we move forward, we will see what are the arbitrage opportunities available. If factoring costs are very high, as I mentioned, also in certain geographies, Q1, we saw them going shooting up. We decided to go for plain vanilla borrowing. So uh, we'll continue to keep evaluating, uh, but as I said, uh, we, we we will see uh, we will work towards the net debt reduction target what we had guided for at the beginning of the year. Got it. And and just a uh, sort of a quick question on uh, your perpetual bonds. Uh, what's the company's current status on the same? Uh, is it you know uh, to be called at the first date, or or is it a decision that should be taken later? Uh, and maybe only at the step update. Well, you know, by definition, they are perpetual, so they need to be. Uh, they they remain. We'll we we'll closer to the, you know, after five and a half years, there's an interest re uh, reset, and we'll uh, we'll we'll put up with the board and decide as to how we want to, whether we would like to continue or discontinue. I think some of the rating agencies, even if we continue after five and a half years do not give us the benefit of uh, it being treated, 50% of it being treated as equity. So we will take Paul uh, based on uh, when we are closer to the date, which is at the end of five and a half years, where we have the interest reset to be done. Got it. Thanks a lot for your answers. Thank you, Abhinav, for joining us. Thank you. And our next question is from the line of Antonio Luis Gomez from 91. Please go ahead. Hi there. Thank you for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I, I just had a couple of questions regarding your your financial policy. Um, you know, you mentioned the 400 million uh, uh, debt reduction, and, and as you've mentioned, the receivables factoring. You know, you're looking to keep it stable. I, I was just wondering on the on the equity. You know, uh, any any dividends or share buybacks that you're planning on. Um, you know, going forward, uh, and, and what kind of free cash flow you're looking for overall towards the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Antonio. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, so, Antonio, as far as uh, share buyback is concerned, uh, we've done it at the beginning of the year, and uh, as for the regulators in India, we cannot do one until next until next 18 years, 18 months from now. And therefore, we have no intentions as of now, at least for this financial year. Statutory, we cannot do. And not that we have any intentions of doing a share buyback again, having just completed one. Uh, as far as dividends, we do, uh, our policy is put up on the website. Uh, we declare anywhere between 20 to 22 percent of our PAT, 20 to 25 percent of our PAT as dividends. And uh, that's, that's, that's our policy, unless. Uh, that is, uh, at the end of the year, based on the financial results and the cash flow, if the board decides, uh, then we may, you know, we may change the policy. But I don't see that happening. That's been a consistent policy for many years now. So, and whatever free cash we have, we go to reduce our debt and uh, uh, besides whatever is the budgeted capex and other, uh, you know, so to say, the budgeted expenses and other things. So that, that's broadly our 
financial policy on free cash flow. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio, for joining us. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Abhijit Akela from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. Um, uh, so, just a couple from my side. First is on uh, the guidance. <clears throat> just wanted to clarify whether this 15 to 18% revenue, uh, sorry, EBITDA growth guidance is uh, on a US dollar basis and should we take, uh, you know, the FY22 base of EBITDA as uh, $1.368 billion? Would that be the right, uh, you know, assumption to make? Uh, I think, uh, we have to go with the INR, whatever it is. We uh, use this and... Uh, uh, our original guidance also was on INR. So basically, guidance is typically we give it on INR basis only. That's our reporting currency, right? Okay, so it's on an INR basis. Okay. Um, and second, on the uh, uh, balance sheet front, uh, you know, the guidance of 80 days for net working capital, um, the last quarter's presentation showed a net working capital days of 69 uh, as of March 22. Um, so how should we, uh, you know, read that? Uh, I mean, is there a, you know, 10-day increase in networking capital that we are talking about? And uh, the other thing I just wanted to check was on Latin America, last quarter we had guided to about single-digit revenue growth for fiscal 23. Uh, it seems to be growing considerably faster than we had anticipated, which probably puts pressure on the working capital. So, you know, how do we sort of uh, manage that situation? Thanks. Sure. No, so you're right. You know, I mean, we delivered uh, 69 days, and uh, it would be our endeavor to keep improving on the working capital. Uh, we always give a bit of a conservative guidance, and uh, therefore we, we have always, even last year we had guided for 80 days around those levels, and uh, we, we maintain that for a business of the model which we follow and the business of our size, we, we will rather be conservative than to shoot our, uh, overshoot our guidance. But as, as you have seen, last year also we delivered much better numbers on working capital, and that endeavor to keep reducing our working capital year on year is something which we continue doing. It. So uh, you're, you're right, and maybe you know you can pen in something in between for your modeling, but that's broadly the uh, indication from our side. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe on, on Latin, on maybe yeah, I'll yeah, give it to maybe I'll jump in on. Perfect. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, coming out of Q1, you know, which is a smaller quarter for us, but we clearly have significant momentum in Latin America with overall growth of 38%. So, you know, as we increase our overall guidance on revenue, we we would expect that uh, Latin America will, you know, be greater than the the single digit growth, and so uh, that would be our expectations now. There are parts of Latin America where working capital is quite efficient and other parts, uh, such as Brazil, where our working capital is not quite as efficient. So we're working with our teams there and with our, with our partners, and we're looking for ways to uh, improve the uh, working capital efficiency. You know, I do believe that we will have success of doing that this year, although it will like to be a multiple-year journey. Uh, but, yeah, depending on where our growth is, it does have an impact on uh, on overall working capital. So that would be the color on our Latin America growth. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I'll come back in the queue for any more. Thanks, Abhijit. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of S. Ramesh from Nirmal Bang Equities. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, my first thought is uh, on the uh, stupendous performance in Latin America and uh, uh, North America, and to see the ground level, you know, data point and commentary, we have been talking, uh, hearing negative news on the weather and the, you know, expensive uh, cost of chemicals and fertilizers. So uh, what has exactly driven this growth in spite of all the uh, challenges? And is there any uh, inventory you have pushed to the trade uh, which explains the volume growth? And secondly, what is the current status on your uh, credit rating? Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll start with the uh, Latin American, North American business, and then on and you can uh, talk about the, the credit rating. So, I mean, generally speaking, coming into the planting season uh, in the Americas, you know, the, the, the weather uh, was, you know, generally in, in a good situation. I, again, other than, I would say, some parts of Mexico and then the western part of the U.S. where it's been extremely dry, 
so the crop got planted, the row crops got planted, and our portfolio, uh, you know, was performed very well. Now, look, I, I think the entire market was strong. So as the rest of the industry, you know, will be reporting over the next several weeks, I, I would expect that there's overall strong market growth across the Americas. Um, I do think our performance is going to be on, on the high side, uh, both from a price and a volume standpoint. Um, and, you know, you, you talked about product costs. Uh, there's no question, of course, including with our portfolio, that the prices are higher. Uh, of course, our costs are higher as well. Uh, when you take it to the grower margins, you know, based on uh, strong commodity prices for row crops, uh, generally in, across the Americas, the, uh, the income statement uh, is going to be strong. Margins will be strong for growers uh, ac- across that region. So that, that's how it's played out. In terms of inventory, look, I do think there was probably a little bit of, uh, of incremental buying this year in anticipation of a strong market. And with uh, everyone a bit concerned about uh, product availability, when we look at our portfolio in particular, we believe that channel stocks are in good in a good position. Um, and so, with our, our core products in the marketplace, uh, we think that we're you know well positioned from a channel stock standpoint. And on top of that, we've got a number of new products that we're launching, over 80 products in total around the world. Uh, and some very significant blockbusters that we're launching uh, in Brazil and the U.S. Um, so, yeah, we're very optimistic. We're going to continue to see strong growth, you know, for the rest of the year uh, across that region. Anna, maybe you can then pick up on the credit agency question. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Ramesh, we, uh, that's, that's something which we are engaged with the rating agencies. We are extremely conscious of our uh, investment grade rating, uh, and uh, you know, we, are, you know, if you look at plain, if you do a simple calculation of net debt to EBITDA, we are well below the two, which is the threshold for investment grade rating, and we are well below that. And if you see the margins improving this year, uh, I mean, it will only be, it will only improve further. Having said that, uh, you know. Each rating agency has a different model. Uh, they, some of them add back the uh, non-recourse, some add back certain uh, of the cash which is on the balance sheet. They only consider certain cash as free cash. The others they, uh, you know, consider as a part of the business requirement and so on and so forth. So there are different formulas. So we keep monitoring the situation. We work hard to make sure we remain as uh, investment grade rating. But we keep uh, engaging with the rating agencies and in, on a regular basis. So that's that's we are, we, are, we are conscious of. In summary, I can only say we are conscious that yes, we are at the borderline, and we will work hard to maintain our investment growth. Thank you. So, if I may just squeeze in one more uh, question. So in terms of your guidance, uh, um, are you expecting normalized weather for the rest of the year, and what is the risk to that in case of? Any uh, commodity price deflation, would that have a negative impact on your margins as you cut prices? Can you give some thoughts on that? Mike, maybe. Uh... Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, you know, based on our guidance, I would say, you know, we're expecting reasonable weather throughout uh, uh, the, the, growing, the key growing areas. That being said, you know, much of uh, Q2 uh, and, and, and even parts now of Q3, we do have orders in hand. Um, you know, supply chain is working hard to uh, deliver against uh, that opportunity. So I, I, we wouldn't anticipate, um, you know, price pressures necessarily in Q2 and Q3. Um, look, at some point, if, if commodity prices, grain commodity prices come down and grower margins are challenged, that would be a, a different scenario. Uh, that's not what we're seeing right now. We're seeing grower margins strong. Um, and so, look, I think it's a dynamic marketplace and at this point in time we're still in an inflationary environment from a, both a cost of goods standpoint uh, across SGNA um, and again you know grower margins based on commodity prices you know have, have supported this the, the current market dynamic thank you very much um, all the best as I join the queue thank you thank you next question is from the line of Surya Patra from Philip Capital Thank you for the 
taking my question. Uh, uh, Mr. Patra, I'm sorry, we can't hear you clearly. Can you switch it to handset mode, please, and speak? Yeah, okay. Uh, is it right? I'm audible. Yeah, we can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, congratulations for the uh, great set of numbers. Uh, and uh, particularly the the key market, the kind of strong growth number what we have reported. So, I'm just trying to understand... Uh, is it possible to share what is the volume uh, volume rise and uh, what is the price rise uh, in the key market at least North America and Latin America? And uh, that is one. And secondly, uh, whether this growth is to some extent uh, contributed by the operational challenges what your uh, European peers would be currently facing, whether you have uh, uh, realized any benefit of that competitive advantage. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, uh, you know, as we provided in the uh, materials, uh, overall, the volume increase was 6%, price increase 18%. Um, I would say, you know, specific to your question, in North America, it was heavily weighted to volume, and in Latin America, it was heavily weighted towards price. And so there was some difference between those two markets. Uh, volumes were, were uh, you know, less of a contribution uh, in Latin America, and, and we did see really strong um, herbicide, insecticide, fungicide movement in North America, and so our volumes there were, were, were quite strong. Um, yeah, so that, that's, you know, on just from a volume versus price. With respect to, you know, the, the competitive set, look, I, we haven't seen any uh, impact from an operating standpoint uh, across our competitors. Um, I think supply chains have continued to be a, a challenge, including uh, freight and logistics. Um, I think the resiliency of our supply chain is clearly one of our competitive advantages. Um, as I talk to our customers, especially some of the global uh, retailer and distributor companies that really understand uh, the impact of, of global logistics, uh, we are viewed as, as a company that, that can, you know, be extremely reliable in uh, delivering product, and that that has given us a, a competitive advantage. And so I think that's an advantage that's going to be durable. Um, but um, yeah, specifically to the European competitors, we haven't seen anything specific at this point in time. Sure, sir. So just uh, a extended question uh, on this. Uh, so how should we look at this gross margin scenario? Uh, see. Uh, while the prices has uh, gone up by 18%, uh, there is a favorable currency factor. Still, the gross margin remained almost uh, YOI remained flat. So, uh, you know, how should one really means? And there is a kind of integrated operation that we generally uh, uh, boast for. So, so how should one uh, see the gross margin uh, rate going ahead, uh, moving? Uh, uh, so how should be that panning out uh, moving ahead? Uh, uh, any sense on that could be useful. Yeah, so I think if you kind of zoom out on the situation and look at our portfolio, you know, last year about 30% of our portfolio sales were differentiated in sustainable products and about 70% mm -hmm. were post-patent. As we look ahead and look, say, to uh, over the next five years, we believe the evolution of that mix will, will move to more towards a 50-50 mix. Um, as we as we see the performance in our portfolio today, um, we can see that that uh, cost of goods impact has a much lower overall impact on our differentiated and sustainable products. And so, I think that part of our portfolio is extremely durable. Um, you know, as you know, if if we see commodity prices change going forward, obviously the post patent part of our mix. Uh, is um, impacted at a higher rate based on cost of goods as well as commodity prices. And so that part of our portfolio, I think, will be more dynamic uh, as, as uh, you know, as the markets evolve and the differentiated and sustainable products, which is our, our, our fastest growing segment overall, if you look over the, the next uh, three to five years, that part is is less impacted by this volatility in, in cost and commodity prices. Okay, so just a quick question sir, on the MPP bio solutions. I think it has performed a, uh, performed like any uh, strongly this quarter across various regions. So can you share what is the 
uh, what is the cumulative number for the quarter? Uh, yeah, so we, we don't break out uh, by segment on a quarter-by-quarter quarter basis. We, yes, we provide yes. that guidance on the year. And so, you know, we guided uh, for the year that we expect our mix will be approximately 31%. Uh, sustainable and uh, um, differentiated products this year. You know, Q1 is is a smaller quarter for that part of our business, and so I would say there's there's not a lot to read through uh, based on you know how Q1 played out. That being said, just like Ashish talked about from an India perspective, you know there there is a lot of interest, uh, and growers are are looking at the the significant portfolio that we do have in biosolutions. And we continue to add to that portfolio from an innovation and a collaboration standpoint. So, yeah, we're very excited about uh, that part of our business. Uh, we're, we're, we're leading in that uh, whole sustainability front right now, and, and we look, we're looking for more collaborations uh, going forward. And so we do expect that we'll see good growth in that part of our business um, as the quarters evolve. And like I said, the, the first quarter is not a significant Order, uh, specifically globally for the NPP uh, portfolio. Sure, sure. Thank you. Wish you all the best, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Vishnu Kumar from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, and thanks for your time. Uh, I want to understand on the uh, ground level measures that we are actually doing to bring down the uh, working capital base, or be it the debtors or even inventory or the payables. Because, that, uh, because it appears that we are growing the fastest in the market, which has the highest working capital base. So this is becoming a circular reference every quarter for us. So how do we really break this? And, or, or at least on the ground, are we doing something different at least that going forward the uh, I think the working capital days could slightly come off. Uh, she could help us understand on this. Mike, maybe you can see yeah. up and then I will chip in. Yeah, perfect, on and So look, it's a it's a very important question, and and, and we we do have a lot of focus on this uh, specific area with all of our, our our teams on the ground, and we're working closely with our customers, and we are looking for opportunities to uh, you know look at our portfolio. Uh, again, as we look at uh, our differentiated and sustainable portfolio where margins are strong, uh, you know, we, we continue to want to have commercial terms which really benefit those products and allow us to grow that part of our business, you know, exponentially. I think as we look at just the margin uh, profile of our entire business, and, and, you know, just like in any business, there's, there's parts of our portfolio that are lower margin. And so... Yeah, I, I think as we think about our business going forward, we're, we're going to be more discerning on uh, payment terms and credit that we provide uh, on on the lower margin part of our portfolio. But again, I think this is going to be evolutionary in nature, not revolutionary. And so um, it's 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 something that we're very focused on. As On and I both mentioned, we're we're committed to getting to 80 days of working capital uh, by by the time we get to the end of the year and our teams are working hard to make sure that we deliver against that. Uh, thanks. Maybe, you know, we have uh, our global head of supply chain, Raj Tiwari, and he can, uh, some of the initiatives that you are taking on inventory management, he can uh, share. Raj, over to you. Yeah, so uh, uh, on inventory, uh, uh, on the first quarter, we have a little bit higher inventory as compared to uh, last year. Uh, it's it's basically because of the fact that uh, you know India has been flat, and uh, we have built uh, you know we are building the inventory for uh, bigger uh, Q2 and Q3, uh, looking at the growth uh, momentum what we have, and as you as you know that you know uh, as you have noticed in the previous uh, years that generally we do that uh, build up. And then in the Q4, you'll find that our inventory comes down dramatically, and we are confident of delivering on on the on the inventory guidance what we had given uh, earlier. Or well, maybe you can allude on some measures which we are taking to reduce the inventory. Well, uh, uh, on on the on on the measures, uh, you know, specifically for you know for you know inventory, what we have what we are doing is. Uh, we are uh, running a project specifically on on uh, on inventory uh, measurement 
uh, wherein wherein we are uh, uh, you know we are looking at uh, uh, you know you know building the inventory at technical level and not at uh, formulation so that we can be closer to the market and when the demand come comes up or pens up at that point of time we can quickly for, formulate and uh, and uh, serve the serve the market uh, especially uh, for uh, latam and uh, and you know and in the us as i mentioned during our uh, annual investors meet uh, we are uh, we are targeting a 10% reduction on the inventory as compared to uh, last year the uh, you know closing and that i'm uh, confident that we should be able to achieve thanks so uh, you know to your question vishnu there are several initiatives being taken and uh, as also mike mentioned in his uh, initial remarks uh, i think we we are, we are we are really working hard to make sure that uh, we manage and see how we can improve on our working capital and there are several initiatives being taken both on receivable on inventory slow moving inventories and so on and so forth so uh, it's it's a it's a clear focus area and uh, we we will see, we we are quite confident that we will be able to bring some changes by the end of this year got it sir and uh, just just on the uh, commodity prices uh, on one side uh, we are seeing some softening and secondly we are taking price hikes wanted to understand that uh, uh, next couple of quarters should our margins expand and uh, also connected point if crude were to stay stabilize at 100 or say closer to 90 uh then is there a possibility of a faster working capital release because i think as of march we were at probably at 100 100 115 uh what we closed and assume if it ends up slightly lower then should we see a fast should we see a guidance of 400 go up slightly this i mean hypothetical question but at least directionally if it is possible on both these yeah so on on commodity prices you know they they did spike up three or four months ago and of course we've seen at least in most row crops uh those prices have come back down i mean generally the the prices are very strong and as i mentioned earlier um uh, you know grower margins are still supported uh based on you know both current and future uh commodity prices i think in terms of our margin expectations um uh, you know we do expect uh, uh an increase in margin uh on the year um you know again depending on what what happens with cost of goods as the quarters play out we'll see how that evolves so we would anticipate uh a little bit of a strengthening of margins as as the year plays out and you know especially as we look at Q2 Q3 got it sir. and one question if i may uh, on on brazil uh, we have been growing quite a quite pretty fast uh, as one of the co- uh, previous participants were also asking uh, if uh, if our european competitors uh, are not able to supply in the market uh, do we have a significant headroom for growth in this market or we are more or less there uh, from a medium term angle uh, if you could just give some direction on this yeah so again at this point we're not applying yeah no understand um you know we're not anticipating that there's going to be significant shortages uh you know but um look we we've got a very strong portfolio in brazil we you know our open ag farm where we uh are focused specifically on UPL products in both soybeans and corn over 70% of all the inputs on this uh research and demo farm are UPL products and so we have a portfolio that really uh scans across both crops and on that farm we're seeing uh yields much higher than average yields and so we're we're very confident in our portfolio we're launching new products this year like evolution like fine sink uh which is one of our important herbicides and so um you know we we have growth built in we'll, one of the strengths and i think core competencies of UPL is our agility so as the market evolves and you know if if certain situations happen with our competitors again we'll use our agility as one of our core strengths to take advantage of any opportunities got it sir thank you and all the best thank you thank you thank you and next question is from the line of tarang agrawal from old bridge capital please go ahead hi uh, good evening uh, three questions from my side 
uh, one, uh, you know, while Brazil is the biggest crop protection market and it's been doing reasonably well there, but uh, it is also a sizable portion of your business now, which brings in reasonable amount of concentration risk, whether it's geography or, uh, uh, you know, uh, clearly uh, in terms of balance sheet. So how should we see this, uh, you know, sort of getting hedged over a span of next two, three years? Do we anticipate uh, this part of the market to uh, contribute lower than what it does right now? And if so, what are the steps that are going to be taken to sort of uh, address that? That's number one. Number two, if you could give us a sense on what your working capital cycle is across the markets that you operate in. And uh, number three, uh, with uh, the fire incident is unclear, uh, did it have an impact on your business uh, in Q1? If so, if you could give us some qualitative sense as to how it impacted your business. That's it. Thank you. All right. Why don't, why don't we answer that in reverse order? So, Raj, why don't you take uh, the uh, yeah. question and then, and then yeah. uh, on on you can take the working capital cycle. So this uh, fire uh, was uh, in, a, in a plant which, which used to make monocotophores, and uh, uh, you know there would there 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 is a very small impact. Uh, basically, India business. So monocotophores is India based, and uh, that's a very uh, small. Uh, you know, out of the total years, the requirement of monocotophores, 50 percent volume we already had in hand. So it's only about you know 50 percent volume loss of business. So, uh, which is which is not significant, uh, which is uh, quite uh, quite small. So that's uh, that's on on that fire incident, uh, uh, you know, loss of business uh, which you asked. Thanks, Raj. And uh, so, Talang, on the working capital by region, we generally don't share that data because uh, you know it's not only that uh, we do factoring in some markets, we don't do. And uh, then the terms vary from each market to market. Within that, also within the crop, the terms vary. So it's, it's you know, depends on the what sort of uh, weather, what cropping is done, and that that determines the working capital because in certain markets it has to be based on uh, the what you call the crop terms. In certain markets, the fixed 90 day. In France, it's 45 days as per the statute. So it varies from markets to market. Uh, or do you might on maybe just on yeah. yeah on on Brazil so look I, I think if you look out over the next two or three years um, the reality is we we've got strong momentum in Brazil but also in many regions outside of Brazil so I wouldn't anticipate a material a material change in in the mix of our business from a geographic standpoint in the next two or three years um, um, you know the strength where we're going to see, I think, exponential growth uh, beyond Brazil is going to be in North America, uh, in India, in Southeast Asia. We're seeing very nice growth across Africa uh, right now. And so in, with our NPP business, that really has a global opportunity for us and, and probably weighted very heavily uh, on Europe. And so we do have a number of layers of growth that, I, that we are aggressively pursuing uh, you, you know, outside of Brazil. That being said, our Brazil business and portfolio is extremely uh, strong, and so we're going to continue to, I believe, to see strong growth in that market, though, as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Rohan Gupta from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Hi, sir. Good evening, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, the question is on uh, our increase uh, or reduction in factory uh, per se. So, basically, a lot of working capital requirement has gone into that. Just wanted to understand that the reduction in factory, uh, which are the primarily key markets where you have reduced the factory, and uh, uh, and where you see that going forward, this number can be for the year. Uh, thanks, Ron, for joining us and uh, for your question. So, Ron, uh, currently at least we have reduced factoring in Latin America, where the interest costs have gone significantly higher. Uh, so, we will we are monitoring the situation. I mean, at least I don't see it, the cost coming down over the next one one or two quarters. 
So we'll, we'll probably compensate that by doing it out of uh, more in, in other markets like U.S. and Europe. Uh, that's as of now the plan. Let's see where we, how the interest rates behave as we move forward. Uh, and the factoring, uh, definitely not only just improve our cash flows, but also give you in terms of hedges as against any, uh, uh, any, uh, payment failures. So do you see that this Latin American market where the reduced factoring and increasing working capital increases your risk of, uh, uh, bad debts and, uh, uh, and the, and the, uh, further increasing overall working capital cycle overall? Oh, so we looked at uh, those things, aspects, and you know, based on that only we took a decision that we would better go for uh, taking plain vanilla loans instead of going for factoring because we looked at the track record over the last three years and uh, we have uh, extremely low uh, bad debts uh, in single decimal. So we are, we are, we are quite comfortable and uh, considering where the interest costs have gone up almost three Three times more. I mean, average cost of borrowing last. I mean, the CDI, what you call uh, in Brazil and some of the other LATAM countries, the basic bank rates, they have gone up almost 300 percent. You know, they were in the range of four to six percent. They are now in the range of 12 to 15 percent. So, it doesn't doesn't make sense to pay that sort of cost cost of borrowing. And this is the last on my side. So, on the increase uh, or revised uh, guidance for the year of uh, can you just give some uh, more color that it, it is primarily driven by uh, that growth and uh, which are the key markets you see that uh, there is a higher growth which you uh, which are which you are predicting now with, than earlier when you gave the guidance earlier. Mike? Yeah, so, um, Ryan, I, I would say, again, we'll likely see very strong growth coming out of the Americas uh, across across the Americas, uh, strong growth in, in Southeast Asia, in Australia, and in uh, India and Africa. Um, I think those, all those markets will contribute to our growth and, and are giving us confidence in uh, the revised guidance that we issued today. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, we'll be taking our last question. That's from the line of Rohit Nagraj from Centrum Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, congrats on a strong set of numbers. Uh, my first question is on the FMC contract. So where are we currently? We've started uh, you know, supplying the material. And when are we expecting uh, material benefits uh, from this particular collaboration? Thank you. Yeah, so maybe there's two aspects to that. One one is from a supply chain standpoint. The other one is from a commercial standpoint. So all that all that Raj talk about the supply chain piece of it. Commercially, we have started commercializing uh, CTPR in uh, a number of markets. As we look at the next uh, 24 months, uh, we have the opportunity to commercialize in more and more markets. And so, if for FY uh, 23, this will not be a material part of our business. By looking at FY24 and beyond, it will become a, a more important part of our business. But, Raj, maybe you can also talk about it from a supply chain standpoint. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, Rohan, um, um, on the CTPR, uh, on, the, on the supply uh, chain side uh, agreement, we have already uh, commissioned the plant in, this, uh, in the last quarter, which is the you know, Q1 of this year. And we have uh, started uh, already commercializing uh, the supplies uh, to FMC. All right. Uh, thank. Uh, so, second question again, hopping on the working capital. So, uh, the higher working capital is also a function of gaining market share from competitors, or uh, is it purely based on the other factors that uh, we have, you know, elucidated in our discussion? Thank you. Maybe yeah, so I, I would say, yeah, yeah, you know, so specifically, we're not using, let's say, our balance sheet to try and uh, gain advantage over competitors. And so we're not going out with extended terms or something like that uh, to gain uh, an advantage. In fact, 
we're, we're being very diligent with, uh, with how we position our products. That being said, uh, you know, I think with our increase in volume in INR of, of 6%, uh, it's likely on the higher side. So I do believe we are gaining share in the marketplace, and I really think it's based on our, uh, you know, the strength of our portfolio, our go-to-market approach, and the relationships that we've established uh, with our customers, and again, the view and the understanding of our the resilient supply chain we have, and we're getting the benefit of that when customers are looking at alternatives and they're, they're deciding to de-risk their business by partnering with us. And so those are the advantages we have, uh, uh, I would say, uh, in our business right now. Right. Got it. Just one last clarification uh, on revenue growth guidance of 12 to 15 percent. Uh, what is the volume growth that uh, we are considering? You know, so again, coming out of Q1, we saw, you know, about one quarter of our uh, revenue increase was from uh, from uh, volume and about three quarters from, from price if you ignore currency. I, I would say that ratio will likely make up our, our growth as we look at the whole year. So there will be a piece of it, a quarter to a third, that will be volume-related, and, uh, you know, two-thirds to three-quarters that will be more price-related. Right. Uh, got it. Thanks for all the uh, answers, and uh, best of luck, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on this call. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to either reach out to me or to Radhika. We'll be happy to answer the calls, uh, answer your questions. Thanks once again for joining us on the call. Thank you. Thank you, members of the management. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UPL Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now.